Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank all the organizers here for giving me an opportunity to talk. But contrary to what the, um, our chairman has said, I will talk some of the work which I did during uh, collaboration with my postdoc supervisor. So actually, uh, I joined IIT Kanpur, uh, sorry, last year, uh, in this time only May, it's been only one year I'm here in. So I'm trying to start up my lab based on this called Iron Trap. So right now I got this lab space, I'm renovating it and people are looking to work in this kind of uh, project are well welcome. So the title of my today's talk read as Gigas in Accuracy Measurements, which is a massive frequency measurement. It means the spark shift in the excited and the ground state is equal. Uh, so, and the clock transition. This clock transitions is the barium ion clock transitions, which is uh, from S half to D5 by 2, and it's at lifetime of 30 seconds. So we will be, uh, in this measurement, I will be using a single trap barium ion, and then do this massive frequency measurement. And in the start of the title itself, I... Where is the pointer? So I put this gigahertz in accuracy because theoretically it is the prediction of this uh, music frequency was in the terahertz regime, but we could uh, do some trick and uh, smart ways of reducing the systematic effect. And then we could measure this frequency in the gigahertz accuracy. So I will be uh, explaining all these details in my presentation. And for the students here, I really ask, um, Suggest you please ask questions. I try to uh, make this measurement interesting and also simple for you guys to understand. But for clarification or anything, you can stop me anytime and please ask questions. So, uh, just to give some uh, outline, uh, what I wanted to tell during this 40 minutes presentation is that I'll give some introductions of why we are really doing this kind of complicated experiments or motivations, so to say. And then uh, discuss all the pre, -pre recursions which required to do this basic uh, wavelength measurements and why we are interested. At the end of the day, I will summarize my presentations. So now, uh, just to give you the, some introductions, why we were doing this kind of complicated experiments. So all these experiments are actually driven by this quest of better technologies. Then you can ask me again, like, what is the meaning of better technologies and why we are interested? So better technologies are the technologies which any layman can use and operate it without knowing what is the fundamental physics and the technologies uh, required in the system. How complicated the technologies involve, he or she doesn't really need to understand about the system or technologies involved in that particular applications. So for, I think most of all, will agree, all of us will agree that the GPS system, which is there in your smartphone is a, a good technology, which everyone can operate without really knowing what are, how many satellite is using to predict my navigation or final destination in this kind of uh, measurement. And uh, the development of the GPS is possible because of the development of the cesium based microwave at atomic clock in around 1950s and National Physical Laboratories London by these two very famous scientists called Louis Eason and Jack Perry. So this is based on this microwave transitions. After this 50 years, more than 50 years of this development, we are presently in a stage of this second quantum revolutions where people are trying to do develop new technologies or based on this quantum phenomena. So one example I can cite you here is the quantum internet, where you want to transfer the information using quantum uh, web principles by teleportations among these one devices. So these devices could be quantum processors, which I will show you in the next, and it has many implications. It can do many things which present internet cannot do it. It will complement the existing internet for the benefit of mankind and also the development of the secure quantum communications. This will be helping us to do the secure banking transactions and everything. It will be really helpful to uh, uh, layman. And um, 
among these quantum processes, I am showing here uh, two processes, which is the present competitors. One is the superconducting based quantum processor and other is an iron trap based quantum processor. This is the image of a chip from my previous, exper from my previous experiment, where we are trapping coal ions on this chip to do this manipulations of this qubit and also uh, uh, the implementations of quantum algorithm. And uh, so this development of the technologies will be possible when we have this faster the transfer of information using optical cables or better clock synchronizations. In order to have better clock synchronizations, we have to improve the present limitations of the clock. Now this GPS clock we have right now has a limit, uh, this list sensitivity is three nanosecond, which can give you an error of 10 meter or so for the destiny for your the navigation system. So this optical, no, oh, sorry. This, uh, this clock, now this clock, present clock is, will be based on this optical transitions, which has 10 to the power five more precise than this microwave uh, uh, transitions. So next is, and another question which I want to address here is why we people are trying to develop or explore the technologies based on atoms and ions. The first answer is atoms has possess universal properties. If they are of same species, then you can compare the atoms from here and there. They will have the same properties in mass, the frequency, the lasers which we are going to interrogate. It's the technologies you develop will be comparable to anyone anywhere in this world. And the next thing is, as you can see that there are various Nobel prizes was awarded in, in recent years for the development of this uh, quantum techniques based on light atom manipulations in 2012 and 2018 for the, in the individual the quantum system manipulations and detections and also for addressing. And also I can tell you that the last year Nobel prize was awarded for this use, demonstrations of this use of the entangled quantum photon pair, which is a quantum mechanics phenomena for these uh, violations of the uh, um, Bell's non-linearities. Non and so this will help us to, for the development of this quantum information science. So all these technologies based on these light atom interactions, first I will revise, some of these properties which we are interested in and which will be used for my measurements. So first of all, let's consider the light as a, uh, as a um, uh, quantized state and a matter represent, no, light as a classical state and a matter atom represented by these two levels, uh, ground state two and excited state one. Separ the separation energy is proportional to this om uh, omega one, two, that's the frequency of these transitions. So when we uh, interact or when we sign a laser light into a, an atom, what happened is that the interaction, because of these interactions of the light and atoms, there are some properties which we look or which are given to us for our measurements. First one is I would say the lifetime, which is proportional to the line width of this excited state transitions. Just to give you some number for, uh, for your perspective, for rubidium uh, 87 D2 transitions from S half to P3 by two is of the order of 26 nanosecond. And another parameters which will tell us the interaction strength is also the detuning, how detune our laser frequency is from this uh, trans atomic transitions frequency. And also this uh, another <coughs> very important parameters which we'll be using in all our experiments, or if you read any papers, you will, that is the Ravri frequency, which depends on this interaction strength of the light and the atoms. So uh, with this, like if I use a laser light, which frequency is detuned, then we can represent the interaction of this light with this matter by uh, this uh, mathematically represented by this expression, which is the susceptibility of this uh, uh, susceptibility. So the real part of the susceptibility is proportional to the dispersion and the imaginary part will give us this absorption in the medium. Uh,
So, uh, but in a, in a conditions where I make my detuning is equal to zero, means when you sign the light is exactly on resonance with this uh, transitions, then what happened to the atoms? So the atoms will oscillate between the ground and the excited state uh, with a period proportional to this interaction spring rabbi frequency. So from the, pro if you know this, this oscillation, rabbi frequency oscillations, from here, you will set all the parameters of your measurements. Let's say for state preparations and detections. For example, if I want to prepare my state in, in one of the state, let's say ground state or excited state, I have to do optical pumping. After that, we have to sign a pi pulse to make it equal total transfer of the populations from the ground state to excited state. And if I want a superposition of the ground and excited state is a pi by two pulse, which is also called Hadamard gate in the quantum information science communities. So next thing I wanted to tell you is the Doppler cooling of the light. Uh, so we uh, like for the development of this uh, Doppler cooling uh, technologies, the, the 1997, the Nobel prize was awarded to this uh, famous scientist, uh, three scientists, Bill Phillips, uh, Cohen Tenozis and Step Chu. So uh, there, like as I discussed earlier, representing the atom as a simplified two level system interacting with a counter propagating photon. Uh, uh, then it, when it absorbs this photon, what will happen is that it will go to the excited state and emitting the photon, it will come to the ground state by a spontaneous emission. And during this whole process of this absorption and emissions, there, the velocities of the atom will reduce by this uh, proportional to this required velocities. And for, uh, uh, again, I repeat, use, uh, giving you example by using rupidium 87, which is of the order of six millisecond, uh, millimeter per second. And this is how we will uh, use this uh, laser to cool the velocities of the atoms or to cool the atoms or ions in our trip. Next thing is this AC Stark sieve. This is a sieve, or uh, this is the physics which we'll be exploring in this magic frequency measurements. So any experiments which claim that they have measured this magic frequency, everybody use this AC Stark sieve. So in AC Stark sieve, what happened is that in a beer level atoms, is, oh, sorry. In a beer level atoms, which is interacting with a laser light uh, of uh, its electric field is represented by E, then this, uh, which is, uh, you can have various detuning, the level of this beer atom will be shifted. And this is proportional to this polarizability of this atom and also the strength of the electric field and N represents the polarizations of the light which we were signing. So this AC Stark sieve, if we want to make it larger, we have to increase this intensity of the light. And also uh, mm, you know, this polarizability, this, the response of this atom. So larger the polarizability, larger the sieve will be. So when we wanted to do the measurements, we look for the particular species which have this larger polarizability. Okay, now I have tell you some of the physics which we'll be using to do this measurement. I came to explain about this atomic clock laser. So in order to do these measurements, we need a laser which can read that frequency of that transition. So particularly in a lab, we have a laser system that will call this atomic clock laser generally or qubit laser which will be interrogating a particular well-chosen, uh, judiciously chosen transitions of an atom, the clock transitions. Let's say for barium, it will be this S half to D five by two. In as a level diagram, I will show you in the later part of my presentation. And this edge, uh, uh, laser will be locked to a very narrow line with cavity, which has a very high finesse. In our case, it was an uh, ultra low expansion cavity and that helped us to reduce the line width to uh, some kilohertz or hertz level. After that, we will be using this frequency comb phase lock, this frequency comb to this laser. This frequency comb will help us in two uh, ways. One needs to read this frequency because the optical frequency which we were doing this measurement is in the terahertz range. It's just in the 10 to the power 14. So we cannot read terahertz with the development of the technologies is not that advanced in terahertz. So we have to convert this terahertz frequency to the mega in this radio frequency range where all the technologies for reading, manipulation, detection is developed. 
So this will be helped by this frequency comb. And again, this frequency comb, we have to track this slow drift of this laser. So the slow drift of this laser in the level of 10 to the power minus 14 per day will be tracked using this hydrogen maser. Though, and then this hydrogen maser, in order to compare with the external one world, which we have to use this SI calibration. In our lab, we use this GPS time-based link, which we can calibrate uh, the PPM with this hydrogen maser. And from there, we can do the uh, all the systematic analysis associated with the drift and also the long-term frequency drift of these lasers. So now why we are going to use this optical atomic law because atom is a perfect oscillator with the same frequency which everyone can use. And we will be using a single ion in, in these experiments. So I have set up, now I have some precaution, like I know how, what physics to use to this measurement, and I have these lasers. So now what I have to do is that I have to uh, trap this barium ion in a vacuum chamber using this Doppler cooling lasers and uh, lasers and detection lasers, and I have to interrogate the clock cycle. So for this I, uh, multi-level atoms, the Doppler shift, uh, will be uh, will have two terms. First term is called the dynamic differential polarizability and in proportional to this polarizability and electric field. And second term is the tensor polarizability. And this theta is angle between this stark laser polarization means the light uh, which the laser which we will use to induce the stark polarization, uh, stark uh, sifting that is the polarization of this laser. And the quantization axis is defined by our applied magnetic field in these experiments. Uh, and uh, then I, here I wanted to give some more motivations why we were doing these experiments. So the black body radiation shift in the iron base clock is proportional to this dynamic differential polarizability. So for barium is kind of large, so it was for easy for us to measure this barium black body radiation shift for our experimental setup. And another thing is that theoretically, it is predicted that this uh, magic wavelength is around 653 nanometers. But in this, as you see in this, uh, more details about these theoretical papers you can find in these references. And also that uh, <laughs> there is a discrepancy between these two curves, which was one use all the theoretical model that is the solid line. And other one is the theoretical models will some input from the measurements of this uh, lower excited state, like the lifetime and also the transition string. Uh, so we, what, in order to point down this discrepancy, what we really need to do is to measure this magic frequency. And this frequency uh, using this barium transition. So as I discussed earlier, we are going to measure this uh, clock transitions magic frequency around 653 nanometers. So what we have to use is that we will use this laser to read, <coughs> to, uh, read out the frequency. <coughs> SIF uh, introduced by this uh, uh, stark laser near 653 lasers. So we have to build an extra lasers, which is not required for cooling and the trapping of this barium ion near 653 man nanometers, and it should be tunable to our requirements. So uh, we will be using a 653 lasers, which we build our, in our lab by using the slab master com com combinations. And we have the clock laser now, we are going to read out this frequency. So how experimental, how you are going to implement in experiments? Sure. Because the no this uh, okay so the barium this um, dynamical uh, the for to measure your black body radiation see what we generally use oh sorry what we really use is this dynamical yeah, differential yeah. Huh. Uh, static polarizability. That is why we really need to pin down this uh, zero crossing frequency. So in experiments, what we have to do is that we have to implement the servo, which will be measuring this S half to D5 clock transitions. And they, we will be measuring the frequency starting from uh, 
ground state ms equal to plus minus half to excited state and by measuring this pair of this frequency measurement we really don't need to do this pair of measurements starting from ms equal to plus minus half you can do only from ms equal to plus half and do these calculations but you doing this help us to reduce the systematic effect uh, and the statistical uh, error during this measurement because it increased the number of measurements so it help us to reduce the uh, statistical error of our measurements No, for the clock, let's say for uh, this no. iron based clock, where it is really needs to understand below 10 power minus 14 fractional frequency step. Okay, so as I told earlier, like we are going to use a single iron trap in a linear pole trap. And then uh, this is the configurations of the iron trap and we will be exploring all these magnetic sub levels of this clock transitions to help us to reduce the uh, statistical uh, error and the systematic shift associated with the common mode um, measurements. And also this is how this experimental uh, like look like. I'm just showing here the pictures where we do these experiments of these ions. This is the iron trap. This is the pole, linear pole trap inside this chamber. You can see where this pink circle is there. The iron will be trapped. And this is all the optical arrangement of these lasers for state manipulations and detections and for this particular experiment. So I wanted to tell a little bit about uh, this uh, this uh, slip laser uh, slip master laser configurations to do this uh, um, uh, stark stiff lasers actually because we have we need the tunabilities in the laser and on top of that we need to increase the power also because this stark stiff is proportional to directly proportional to the intensity of the light and what we did is that we we had two laser kind of two lasers. One is for tunabilities, which has an anti-reflection quartet, and it's a low power lasers. And so we, we use this laser to boost the power in the slave lasers. The, the slave lasers to, doesn't have this quartet, so we have to tune this wavelength by tuning the temperature. So we reduce from room temperature to uh, almost the zero degrees centigrade, like 273K, to tune the frequency. Of, of this laser. And this help us to boost the power around 20 milliwatt just before uh, the chamber. But we uh, sacrifice some of these lasers for this intense active intensity stabilization, which will be required for this kind of particular precise experiments, measurements. And uh, so the, even though there is this intensity stabilization for this, we just a sacrifice around seven or eight if we can increase to that power the precisions may be more than what we could do in our present experiments as i discussed earlier the stark sieve is directly proportional to e squared This is for active stabilizations, and we are tuning this laser's frequency to plus minus three terahertz. So, in order to tune that much frequency, the intensity, if you want to stabilize across that range, then uh, that's a uh, you have to. I have to sacrifice this much power. That's a good question. Anyone has any questions here? Okay. Yeah. This is a two, I, I said one mesh experiment with two results, which is give us both you are, we have this measurement of this magic weapon that will help us to pin down this polarizability. So uh, the pre result, present result, which I am giving here is only for the magic weapon. And we also do this static polarizability calculations of the barium clock to the fractional frequency stabilities of 10 power minus 15. But I'm not giving that result, but in the experiment when you implement, these are the sequences which really need to do this kind of precision. I'm just showing the sequence of the experiments which you have to implement or follow if you wanted to do this kind of precision measurement. So, uh, 
as I told earlier, there is two part. One is the scalar part and the tensor part. If we plug in the numbers from this MF equal to plus minus half to that, that this, this is the scalar shift induced by this dark shift, and this is the tensor shift. So as you can see that this scalar shift is also proportional to the intensity and the tensor shift is also proportional, proportional to this intensity. If we take this ratio of these two term, then this intensity, the error associated or whatever it goes in this experiment will cancel out. So we will use these techniques to get our precisions to gigahertz. But right now here, so when you start this experiment, this kind of quantum measurements, even though you prepare, we pre try to prepare our state uh, as close as 100%, there is always this quantum projection noise, which is associated with quantum measurements. We cannot get rid of this measurement. It will be there for this experimental setup. So we have to, what we have to do is that we have to characterize what is the quantum projection noise of our experiments. So as I have seen here, this quantum projection noise of our measurement comes to be to 1.5 hertz by uh, abrasing over 20 cycles of this uh, measure, 20 measurement cycles. So now I know what is our limitation, how good our instruments or how our clock laser system can do these measurements. So uh, we have, uh, we have taken almost 20 uh, data points, but it spends uh, almost a week to do this measurement. And on top of that, we, because in order to demonstrate the repeatability of these experiments, we in fact repeat this measurement, uh, this point and this point three times, once the grating is, uh, the piezo is scanning up and other one is uh, scanning down. And also we come back after a week and do this measurement again. So this uh, shows that like, if we want to claim something in the precision measurements, we really need to do this uh, measurements many times uh, in a day or many times in a week or a month. So we had uh, like, here I am plotting the X axis is the uh, frequency of this dark shifting lasers and Y axis is this um, scalar polarizability. Uh, proportional to scalar polarizability, that is the stark shift proportional to this scalar uh, polarizability. So uh, as I discussed earlier with this, if I take only this scalar polarizability part, I can measure, I have measured this MISI frequency, which give us this in, the, in terms of, here is this column is in terms of frequency, here is in the web thing. Theoretically, it is detect of, uh, um, it to be around like uh, predicted to be around 650 nanometers. So we can uh, in fact measure only uh, with the 0.9 accuracy. This is what is in the, in the terahertz region. But if we took the, we take the average of this uh, scalar and the tensor polarizability, then this intensity, the part, even though we actively stabilize the intensity of the laser in these measurements, there are some other systematic coming from our instrument like the ethyloning effect and also the pointing stabilities of the lasers uh, during this whole process. So that is get rid by taking the average. And while doing so, we could measure this uh, lambda or you know, of this zero crossing frequency to, uh, gigahertz accuracies. So if you wanted to know more about these experiments or the measurements of this clock, so there are references of which I have given in this presentation. The clock frequency measurement is given in one of the PRL paper, which I have given below. So you can go there and read about this frequency, uh, this clock measurement. And the black body, uh, this MESI frequency is given here and, and, and one of these theoretical papers, which was uh, predicted these measurements. So, With this, I would like to conclude my presentations. Like, and so in the first part of my uh, experiments, I started to measure uh, with and without the stark shifting lasers, which is a differential mode of measurements. It helped me to reject all the common mode uh, 
systematic error it offers our experimental setup. And another thing I, which I characterize is this uh, uh, projection noise. For every quantum measurements, we have to characterize this projection noise because it's the noise associated with our state preparations and also the effect of the system, system which we cannot get rid of. So we always have to characterize this pro projection noise. And in, uh, uh, then I also discuss like this theoretically predicted to be near 653, which is the terahertz accuracy. And we can measure this music frequency with gigahertz accuracy. And it confirms our theoretical estimated zero crossing. And also it gives a support for these theoreticians to do more better studies of the model they have developed to calculate this zero crossing frequency. And by uh, using a clever trick of uh, intensity ratio of this scalar and the tensor sieve, we can remove this intensity variation and it helps us this, uh, to measure or give this precision of the measurement around giga, with gigahertz accuracy. With this, I would like to thank you all and to all my collaborators for helping me doing these experiments. Without their help, it's not possible to do such kind of complicated measurements. Thank you. All.